as it was said when I started out by Amy, when I first started uh, out in, uh, in my career in England, I, I, went, I played pro hockey. I, I was one of those guys who wasn't good enough for the NHL, so I went to Europe and played in Europe and, and, and had a very disgraceful exit from sports. Uh, in other words, I got cut. Um, so I went to Europe and played, and played for a while. And when I stopped playing in Europe, I was trying to figure out, why do I feel so terrible about myself? What's happening to me? And so I, my, my research, as I became an academic, kind of took me into this particular area, more out of personal interest than anything else. And, and so for me, when uh, in getting you to do this exercise, my images would come up with all my past experiences about sitting in my university residence at the University of Toronto and getting Mike Keenan telling, telling me, I'm crap and I'll never play anywhere in Canada again. And he said those words, so I love Mike Keenan. Um, so, um, so, so for me, I, I have a lot of images, and I think maybe you had. And you also had a number of words here, but if we could also link them to some of the causes. So when you think of career transitions, you know, you've got maybe some opportunities, happiness, there's some feelings around it, you've got some emotions, you've got factors maybe that uh, will influence your career transitions, but I still haven't really heard from anyone good, clear definition of what a career transition is. What is popular out there is the word retirement. Is that you'll think, and a lot of these words out here deal with retirement or life after sport, and you've heard the words today all about retirement. And, and I challenge that. I think, I think transitions by definition can mean uh, life after sport, but I think if we look at more, um, uh, I wouldn't say textbook, uh, but research-based, here are some sport-related uh, theories or sport-related definitions of career transitions. And sorry about the screen getting in the way. I can't see it in the corner here. And these are from some very bright people. Needless to say, it wasn't me. Um, but what they've really said is that it could be an event or non-event, i.e. something supposed to happen but it didn't happen, uh, in which all of a sudden the perspective of which you look at yourself changes. And the way other people look at you changes as well. You're transitioning. And in sport, we can even make it a little bit more. We can also talk about it as a moment of crisis. And I think Amy already alluded to it. She said the word injury, the I word, injury. And then we can also talk it about as the aha moment. And I think we just heard, and no doubt Jeff will start talking about a lot of these things and really pull this together in his story. Uh, but, but Kirsten talked about that aha moment right at the very end. It's that transitionary moment. So we use it and we throw that word around a lot after transitions and career transitions. So let me ask you a question. And you can think about that very carefully and then tell your partner, why did you come here tonight? Think about the answer. Why did you come here tonight? When you're ready, tell the person next to you. Okay, so here's where you get to now tell on a person. You can tell me what your partner said. So you can tell me what your partner said because it's a lot easier for you to speak on somebody's behalf. All right. So go ahead. Tell me why some of you are here tonight. Well, it's healthy to follow the path. So what is coming? So we get experience from here and this. At least some people get open mind. Okay. Open the mind a little bit about different aspects of sport. Anything else? Thank you. Yeah, to look for some guidance in terms of what to do afterwards. Okay. Some guidance. Okay. Anything else? Perspective. Perspective. It's very good. Wow. Perspective. And part of what I've been reading, uh, my remit here is to give you some, some ideas behind, first of all, answering what is this whole thing called career transition, trying to make sense of it. And, and again, I think perspective is really what I want to try to get to. You'll, you'll hear through a number of different stories, and Jeff's and, and certainly through Kirsten's, is that people go through a range of different transitions. And some of the research, we can put them into beautiful little boxes. We can have sport, and they can be non-predictable. You don't know it's going to come like the injuries. We have non-sport, non-predictable. So if you think about a family death, yes, death is predictable, but in many ways, it never comes at the right time, so it's non-sport and non-predictable. And it changes who you are, your perspective. And then you have sport and predictable. So you know you're going to be going to the next stage of development. You're going from junior to national team. You, you can understand those transition moments, and you can see them coming. Then you have non-sport and very predictable. So it could be you're going through university, you're going through college, and they're very predictable ways of moving through. And they make a certain amount of comfort, the fact that you can see them coming. 
Well, there's a fancy little model that uh, was been put together and I put together, and it's really quite confusing. But this is the box I want to pay attention to, is athlete identity. This is the perspective I'd like to share with you today. And it's really about the athlete career transition experience. To give you an awareness of what is, may, will, should happen to you, and some of the factors that affect your athlete identity. I'm not going to deal with all of these. I'd like to talk with you about three. And what basically happens is as you go through experiences in your career, both as an athlete and as an everyday person, there's a number of factors affecting you that will affect your athlete identity and in turn can either have a maladaptation or a good adaptation. And it's quite popular right now, this subject matter, because of what's happened in the NHL because we've unfortunately had three deaths in the NHL of players who, who were no longer in the NHL retired and or were moving on to another phase of their playing and they committed suicide or substance abuse uh, as you may well know. And for many reasons there's been a lot of speculation about their athlete identity and their transition, of course concussions come into it and trying to postulate why did this all happen, the big question, why? Well, for me, I like to talk about three different things. Athlete-coach relationship, career planning, and athlete identity. And again, Kirsten's already mentioned a few of these. Here's a fancy term called anticipatory socialization. What this means to start planning for the future. Right? Athletes who engage in career planning while, comp uh, while competing are less likely to experience career transition difficulties following retirement, injury, and deselection. In other words, if you've got a plan in your back pocket, it's good. Right? It's good to have that plan. And so getting perspective on that is the first thing. And everyone has a story. You have a story, and Jeff will tell his story, but here's the story of an athlete. And we've got a little bit of a, of a, a slight uh, kink here in the, uh, in the projector, but I think that talking about life after sport is more towards when you're deciding that you want to end it. Otherwise, you might start thinking about the end now rather than thinking about where you want to be. I think it could take away from your performances, psychologically, probably in your subconscious. You probably think that you're not going, uh, not thinking about it, but it could be in your mind thinking, I've only got a few years left, I can start relaxing now, rather than push it and push it so you can peak and go out on high. So we were asked to put together a report, and so I was asked to write a, a, a report about this, and we put together a number of recommendations. And there are a couple of recommendations I can share with you. And the first one is, and hopefully as athletes, I'm, I'm asking for your, uh, your, your perspective on this, is one of them is that we're going to develop a national career transition program in Canada. And this fancy recommendation really basically says that Canadian sports centers will take hold of this area, this performance area called career transitions, and really put some services. And I agree with Jeff that, yes, you know, just because you put a structure in place doesn't mean it's all going to be great. But it's a start, and it's a start to bring perspective and awareness and support to you, you, the athletes, to give you the opportunity. Recommendation number two is that we provide more branded life services, such as these types of discussions and opportunities to hear from people, such as our panel, and to make sure that you get educational, you get personal, and you get professional assistance. Because it's the mix of all of those when you talk about the, the types of transitions you may be going through. And Dorothy will be speaking to you about that very shortly. And of course, there needs to be support. So looking at people who are advisors that can help you, that can uh, be very supportive of you, can be integrated. I can tell you that in the United Kingdom and in uh, Australia, probably the two best countries that look after this. They have about, uh, how, many, how many advisors are in the UK? So probably about 40 or 50 Amy's, 40 or 50 Amy's, and what happens there is they get dedicated funding from the UK government just for the career transition program. Every sport is given a ring-fenced hunk of money and says, here it is, go hire Amy. And Amy has, all right, 16 different jobs because there are 16 Amy's and they're all with the various sports. So she's actually part of the integrated support team. We all know what ISTs are. You have your psychologists and you have your physiologists and your doctors. One of them is your career transition advisors. And they build that within the actual IST. So that's how they deal with it in the UK. And it's a ratio of one advisor to 80 athletes. In Canada, we have one advisor to approximately 300 athletes. 
So we're not, we're not getting it yet in terms of progression. So we're working on it, and that's what this recommendation suggests. And the next thing, and I think Jeff talked about this, some of you put your hand up when you're in universities, and Jeff, of course, goes, I can't go to university. Well, why can't he? Well, maybe he's too busy and he can't compete at the same time, and, and, but maybe that's, that's okay if that's his choice, but don't let it be his choice because there are no opportunities because uh, what we call friendly universities don't allow him to do correspondence course or distance learning or any hybrid. Why can't we do things differently? And so in, the, in the Australia, they have friendly universities, what are called you know, athlete-friendly universities, that allow you to travel. They allow you to actually take courses in quarters and sections, 10% at a time. They don't actually have to have you sitting there. They can allow you to do a lot of different ways of accomplishing your credits. And the next one is the coach, is that we have to support the coach, that they see it valuable to be coming here, not just because they're supporting you in that athlete-coach relationship, but they too are transitioning people. For every one of you, all right, or the, or the Jeff story where they're crying, I know coaches who do the same thing. They have this incredible post-Olympic, uh, post-Paralympic, you know, what am I doing now? And where are my athletes and how do I deal with it all? So they too go through this in fairness to them. And supporting the coaches is really important. So really the program is to, to tackle a lot of these challenges and opportunities, I've called them, and, and really the program vision is to enhance personal development of elite athletes by providing expert-based resources and insight, uh, and insight athletes need to transition into, within, and from their sport career. Um, there's a lot of partners that are going to be happening in this particular program that will be un un unveiled next year, from advisor training to, to providing people who will be qualified, like Amy, to be helping and supporting people. These are dedicated people, not 20% of their job, it would be their job. <coughs> There's not 20%, that's what Amy does, and the other 80% is something else. It's all what Amy does. Services, so looking at a range of branded life skills, courses, and <coughs> support for all of you. Uh, partnerships, you can see the number of people that have been involved with this and will be involved with this from athletes, camps, universities, colleges, uh, and a lot of work. And pulling together a lot of the great work that's already occurred in the country over the last 10 years. And, and again, Dorothy will, will potentially talk about that, but it's really pulling together, capturing best practice, as well as promotion and awareness to make sure that everyone understands that it is performance enhancing. So that's probably where I will leave it. Uh, unless you have any questions, we'll probably have a panel near the end. But uh, I guess for me, I mean, I try to just give you a little bit of the theory. It's not so much theory, but just call upon the stories. If you listen to enough of these stories, as some of us have, and maybe now you have as well, you can start piecing together a few themes. And I really appreciate Jeff's story because some of those are really practical words of advice and, and they really elucidate the uh, theory. Thank you.